So I'll just wait for that to come out. Okay. So great to have Carl Jones um, from the National Software Academy, School of Computer Science and Informatics at Cardiff University speaking to us today. Um, as I said, Carl, we've got a mixture of your 11, 12 and 13 students here. I think your 13 students have signed up, but I think it's mainly 11 and 12 here today. So I'm going to hand it over to you now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute my mic and I'm going to follow the chat there as well, because I know it can be uh, there. OK, thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everybody. Hello. Yes, my name is Carl Jones. Um, I'll start by just introducing myself. First of all, just somebody in the chat confirm that they can see the opening slide with Derry the Dragon on it, please. Yeah, we can see it, Carl. Uh, I can ah, see. Thank you. Slide. OK, so. As I said, my name is Carl Jones. Um, just a little bit about me before I find out a little bit about you. Um, I'm actually quite local. I attended Bishop Alanda, Boo Hiss. Um, my, my kids attend Whitchurch, or attended Whitchurch. Um, I did my computer science degree in Cardiff University and then tried to get a PhD, which I didn't get. Um, then I spent 23 years at BT, uh, where I did various things, uh, mainly in software development, but a little bit of project management, um, designing big systems, looked after things like children in need and comic relief for a while, worked on the NHS systems as well. Um, all good fun. And I, then I joined the National Software Academy in 2015. And I've been there ever since as a lecturer. Um, hopefully I'm going to pass on some things today that aren't just based on my experience um, as a student many years ago um, from working in industry and from being an academic, um, but also from being a dad um, because uh, my daughter has just finished a degree at Imperial College London. That was uh, in the summer. Um, last summer actually and, and she's just completing now a master's at Cardiff University um, and my son has just left school and is in his first year at the University of South Wales so um, I've got a little bit of an idea of some of the things you've been through over the last couple of years um, some of the questions you may have asked um, and want to ask now as you think about what university you want to go to in the future so what I want to do first of all is get you to complete a Mentimeter so hopefully you've got devices. Um, you're watching this, so you should have something to uh, open a browser in. So if you go to www.menti.com, it will ask you to enter a code. Um, and if you enter 6996617, we can start. And hopefully I can move this on so first of all, what year are you in? So you should be able to tell me um, which year you're in so I can see what the balance is. OK, so there we are, mainly year 12. And. OK. Thank you very much. You can answer this multiple times. So I'm just interested in what range of subjects uh, you're studying at the moment. Obviously, the person in the year 11, you'll be, able, you'll be answering everything probably. Um, but this is just interesting for me to see what the spread is for the year 12s. OK, so for what I can see on the screen at the moment, that's that's a pretty typical mix for people who would be considering computing or indeed any of the related sciences, computer science, maths, and I'm guessing physics and chemistry would be the other ones. Um, whoever put down you know, arts, like that might be the year 11 student. Um, a little bit of arts is actually quite good, um, certainly music and drama. Um, don't don't worry. Those skills are still applicable in, com in computing as well. Um, I haven't put down their English and English literature, but the ability to communicate well, the ability to add, ask good questions when you're working out what a system should do, 
they're particularly important as well. So a good blend uh, is nice to have. Later on, I'll talk about what the entry requirements are at Cardiff, um, and, and you'll see that you, most of you have got a very good um, spread for getting into our courses. So which universities are you thinking of applying to? Um, so I've got at the bottom here, you know, Oxbridge, obviously that's Oxford and Cambridge. Some of you may not have heard the term Locksbridge, um, otherwise it's, it's also known as the Golden Triangle, uh, but that includes the London universities such as Imperial College London, um, University College London, King's and the London School of Economics. Um, Russell Group, uh, Cardiff is one of the Russell Groups, um, most of the high ranking universities uh, such as Warwick, Durham, St Andrews, they would all be in the Russell Group. Um, other universities, um, that's anything other than Locksbridge or the, or the Russell Group. Um, very good universities in, in that group as well. Um, I'll tell you this now, and it's been recorded, but I will say it. Um, you know, there was a time not too long ago when Oxford wasn't the best university in Oxford. Um, there's another university there called Oxford Brooks, and depending on what you measure, um, Oxford Brooks was actually beating Oxford on some things, including quality of teaching. So, um, yeah, there are very good universities outside of the Russell Group and the Locksbridge ones. I'm very pleased to see that um, five of you are thinking of applying or have applied to Cardiff. And just to just, just to see well, you know, what you already know about computing, there's a number of topics here that are hot in computing. Um, I just wonder what areas interest you? So again, you should be able to pick multiple options here. OK, that's interesting. Um, obviously, a lot of people have picked programming because that's the thing you're most familiar with um, if you've done computing in um, in school and, and programming is pretty much foundational to all the things you need to do. Um, you would do some programming if you were doing data science, um, robotics and things like that. Um, but it's interesting, we've got quite a good spread across all the others. Um, I can see that computer games is obviously quite popular. Um, there are specialist degrees in computer games programming um, and computer games development. We don't do one of those at Cardiff. Um, I believe University of South Wales do. Um, and it's quite multifaceted when you go into computer games development. Not only is there a lot of programming, um, but obviously the graphics, the storytelling, um, and maybe even some bit of intelli um, artificial intelligence in terms of working out how um, you know, the various players in the game, um, or characters in the game would, would interact with each other. Um, I'm quite interested by what the something else is. Um, I'm not going to ask people to unmute and tell me, but if you want to drop it in the chat, um, it would be interesting to know. Um, I've put there together data science and, and then I've got artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, those two are actually quite related to each other. Um, a lot of you, if you're doing statistics in um, mathematics uh, at A level, then you'd have a natural path into machine learning because a lot of what machine learning is about is actually fitting curves, fitting graph uh, lines to, to data. Um, cybersecurity is a massive area at Cardiff, as you'll see later on. Um, if you do come for an open day in Cardiff, you'll be able to see our new cyber range, which actually simulates a small city. Um, and what the impact of a hacking attack on a city can be. Um, that's quite interesting for you to come and see. Um, OK, thank you very much. I think that concludes the Mentimeter. So I'll move back to the presentation now. Thank you for your um, answers. So what I'm going to talk about is a fair, uh, an overview of computing courses in general um, and then go into 
what you should think about when you want to pick a course. And, and maybe that will cover some things that you haven't thought about before. Um, then I'll do the very sh shortest of selling pitches for Cardiff uh, and tell you what we offer. Um, and then I think something that probably is on a lot of your minds at the moment is the student experience, is what is it going to be like going to university, um, in, possibly in 2022. You know, I can tell you what it's like now. I can tell you how it's different from last year. Um, and I can tell you my personal view on where we're going to be going um, 2022 and onwards. Um, I can talk a little bit about what happens after graduation and where our students end up and what their options might be. And then hopefully we'll have some time for the Q&A at the end. So computing, like most courses, is going to give you a blend of three things. Knowledge, those things that you need to know. Skills, and those are the things that you need to be able to do. So you apply your knowledge um, to solving a problem. Uh, and you do that by applying the skills that you've learned. So how to program correctly. But there's also behaviours. Um, and these are things about acting professionally. You know, when you leave your course, um, most of you will go into some job in industry. It may be computing related, it may not be. And how you behave um, is just as important as the knowledge and the skills. So those are things like how do you behave in a team? Do you share your knowledge? Um, are you disciplined? Do you turn up to meetings? Do you keep people informed of your progress? Things like that. Um, and uh, degrees will have a blend of knowledge, skills and behaviours in terms of what they cover. Um, the course I teach on, we probably do more on the behaviours than other courses um, because we focus on things like teamwork and group work. None of the courses that you go on is going to cover everything, or if they do, it will only cover it at the at the very briefest of levels. Um, so do have a good look at the courses um, and find out what their strengths and weaknesses are and where you will, um, where most of the teaching will go. One thing I like to do is is, is check out not just what the courses say they will teach but when you look at the universities also look at their research interests um, most of the russell group universities the oxbridge and locksbridge universities will be research intensive um, so that means that their most of the lecturers will be researching topics actively day in day out and what that means is if the taught subjects match the research interests, you are likely to be taught by real experts in their field. Um, and from my experience, most people who are really experts in the field, they love to share that knowledge. So that's one thing to um, to have a look at. If, if the research interest is in something like cybersecurity, it's pretty reasonable to expect that the modules in the cybersecurity area will be taught to you by experts, OK? Also look at the assessments. Um, most of these are going to be on the in the prospectuses of the various universities and on their websites. Um, some universities will still be very exam intensive. So you will do modules, 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 and then you know 60, 70% of your final mark for the module will be based on a final exam. Others will be more blended they will have maybe 10, 20 percent on exams and a lot more on coursework. Um, and some of them may use projects. Uh, my course, a lot of coursework and a lot of projects. I think there's only one exam in the entire programme across the three years now. Um, so you probably know from what you've done in school, whether you like exams, whether you like coursework and things like that. Um, now, to me, it's good to Try to have a blend um, to prepare yourself for dealing with different types of assessments because they will different types of assessments are suitable for different types of um, knowledge or skills or behaviours. Um, exams are very good at testing knowledge. Um, projects are actually very good for testing the way you behave in a group. The other thing is look at the balance of individual work and group work. Um, 
some courses may have one or two modules over the three years which require you to work in a group or a team. Um, other programmes that it will be almost every semester. You will have lots and lots of teamwork and group work because the focus is on behaviours. Um, now, you might not like teamwork and group work. You might actually be someone who prefers individual work. So do ask about what the blend is. All right. And, and the other thing is don't just look for courses that are called computing or computer science. There are other names that will be attached to um, computing courses, for example, things like software engineering. Um, so don't just look for those two magic words of computer science. Do broaden your horizons and look for other course titles as well. Um, and what you'll find is that some course titles will have a, a with after them, and that basically means there's a speciality. OK. Other things to think about, well, do you want to do a three year or a four year course? Um, so a three year course, is typically a bachelor's of science course. Um, many universities now offer what's called an integrated master's. So the bachelor's degree and the one year master's are integrated into one and you do what's typically known as an MSI. Um, with both a bachelor and an MSI, a three or a four year programme, you can add on an extra year and that might either be a placement or uh, a year in industry or some universities will offer a year abroad. Um, so if you have a year in industry, typically between your um, second and third year, you would uh, spend a year in industry with an employer. Um, typically, that's a very good thing to do. Um, what we find is that those students who take the year in industry perform better in their final year. And because the final year contributes a lot to their final mark, they tend to get a higher classification. If you do a year abroad, that would typically be with a partner university. So Cardiff would have partnerships with universities across the world um, and you would go and study there for a year, which gives you obviously a very different outlook um, on life and the world in general. You could do a what I've called a vanilla degree. So that would be typically BSc computer science or you could do a specialism. The difference between a vanilla and a specialism is that your modules that you study will be pre-picked. So, for example, at Cardiff, as I'll show you in a minute, if you do our specialism, which is computer science with security and forensics in your third year, you will definitely do the security and forensics modules. If you do the vanilla one, you could still actually opt in to do the security and forensics modules, but you won't get first choice. So if those modules were full, you would have to pick something else. So other things, as I've said before, think about the proportion of assessment and proportion of group work. Ask about their support for employability skills. Um, so it's not just about leaving university with a degree, um, but you want to leave maybe with a portfolio of work, something that you can carry into um, a job application and show here are my projects. Here are they on, Git on GitHub. Here are things I've done above and beyond. Um, the course. Maybe you want to be a STEM ambassador. That means you go out to primary schools and you teach computing to primary school children. And that is really fun, but also it actually really tests you. Explaining programming to a nine year old is quite a challenge. OK, um, and you can do other things like building your LinkedIn profile, making sure you have a CV that's ready, um, doing mock interviews. Universities will help you through this as well. Uh, and the other thing to think, ask about is how many contact hours are you going to get a week and what are the study patterns, which essentially is, you know, how are you going to learn? Um, and that's been one of the big things that's changed over the last couple of years. And I'll, I'll come to that a little bit in a minute. Of the other things to think about, costs, not just tuition fees, um, but also your maintenance, your accommodation, uh, your living costs. Um, from experience, you know, I had my daughter, as I said, went to Imperial College London. Obviously, the cost of living in London is much higher than in other places, um, but she was lucky enough that Imperial offer bursaries, which counteracted some of those costs. Um, that said, 
Imperial's accommodation was actually a lot cheaper than other universities that we visited. So it is worth doing the maths. Um, location and the journeys. Um, it may seem like a good idea to be 300, 100 miles away from mum and dad, um, but that's a 300 mile journey and how often are you going to have to make it? You know, do you have access to your halls right through? Can you leave stuff there at Christmas and Easter or are you going to have to bring it backwards and forwards? Um, how often do you intend to come home? Things like that are worth thinking about up front. Um, and then also think about student services. Um, most universities will offer um, a range of other services. Um, so they will advise you on money. Um, if you have any disabilities, they will advise you on how to get adjustments for your assessments and your work and things like that. Um, and they can help you with all sorts of things like accommodation in the second year when you want to go into private, maybe not go into halls. Um, how good those student services are and how welcome the university makes you feel and how they support you while you're away from home um, is also something worth taking into account. So here's the sales pitch for Cardiff. Um, we offer two main families of programmes on the left hand side as I look. Um, we have our computer science programmes. We offer a BSc and an MSci, so with three and four years. Our computer science programmes are research led. So we're a Russell Group University. Um, our modules are based on our research, but we still have industry informing us. So there are modules there that are designed to prepare you for going out into industry. Those programmes have the option of a placement and a year abroad. And we have one specialism, which as I said earlier, is in security and forensics. The first year, there are no optional modules. Everybody studies the same, but in both year two and three, um, you will have optional modules to pick from. Now, in terms of entry requirements, um, I think the last thing I heard is our entry requirement is ABB. Um, and for most of the programmes, that can be any A levels. But for our Masters of Science, the MSI four year programme, or for anything that involves a year abroad, you must have A level maths. OK, that is that those are the ones that do require A level maths. Otherwise, um, our maths requirements are, are a B at GCSE. For the standard um, computer science programs. We then also offer this thing called the Applied Software Engineering degree. This is the course I teach on. Um, we're actually based in Newport at a special building called the National Software Academy, which is right next to Newport train station, and we are industry led. So we are very much focused on preparing students to go straight out into industry um, and we actually target smaller companies um, where there may only be a few employees and therefore they can't um, give you as much assistance when you start. Um, so we focus on making sure that our graduates are work ready. They can go and work in a startup um, which are often very exciting places to be um, and, and you can hit the ground running. You're ready on day one to work in, in industry and we do far more project based learning. So you would work with real clients throughout the three years on projects. Um, I think at the moment, if one, two, you would definitely do at least three client facing projects in teams, possibly four. All of the, co um, the uh, codes there, um, I've dragged down off our uh, website and you can see those are all the programs that we currently offer on the computer science side. There is also then the Applied Software Engineering BSc. That one, the Applied Software Engineering, doesn't have the option of a placement year or a year abroad option at the moment. Um, what we tend to do with our Applied Software Engineering students is encourage them to have summer placements, um, which where you work for 10 to 12 weeks over the summer if you add that to the project based learning, um, a student on the applied software engineering degree will have about a year's worth of project experience when they leave us. So important thing I think as you go forward now and about making your choices and 
investigating what universities do is to ask about the blend of of learning opportunities um, and broader opportunities. So on the screen here, you've got you've got me in the middle doing um, a typical walkthrough of code. Uh, this is a year two module that I, I'm teaching in this instance here. Um, and I'm just going through uh, how to code using good design principle, a design principle called dependency injection. On the um, left hand side, as I look, you've got some students playing a game. Um, now, this board game is there to il illustrate project management uh, and how to try to get the greatest throughput of work in a project. Um, we teach these types of things as well. It helps you understand the students understand how to prioritize and how to organize themselves so that when they work in a team, their work actually gets delivered as fast as possible and how, how they can tune it so it works as efficiently as possible. And on the right hand side, um, that's actually a careers event. Um, so these are students who left us a couple of years ago. Uh, that's Kira in the middle, Rebecca to the left, just behind I can see Lauren and um, Holly. Um, so we invite employers in. We also inv invite our careers and employability people to run things like LinkedIn and CV clinics. Um, and that allows you to start networking. You know, these are your future employees. The gentleman there with the badge on um, on the far right hand side, you know, that's a future employer and it gives you the chance as a student to start mixing with those. These are all important parts of going to university and, and things that you would probably want to ask about is um, what type of support for um, post university is, is provided as well. So last year, this is what I said. Um, you know, prior to 2020, what were we doing? We were doing lots of in-person um, teaching. You have a blend of lectures and labs and seminars. Then we, of course, the pandemic struck and almost everything went online. Um, we were lucky that we were able to do maybe one drop-in session a week where you'd actually see a lecture in person, but most things were um, recordings planned activities in terms of um, following through online rec uh, online recordings um, and exercises that you would do and then you would submit for feedback and I, last year I said you know who knew where we were going to be this year um, my personal view was we would have a, a blend of what we did in the past lots of in person and some of the things we picked up where are we now we're still probably mostly online um, most of the interaction I have with students is still done a bit like this over Teams, um, but there is more in person um, and we are always looking to grow it. Um, the likelihood is that at the, we will grow to about two days a week in person after Christmas, depending on how the pandemic situation develops and what the, um, the Welsh Government uh, decides are the constraints. But what we've learned is that there are some things that are better done online. Some things work really well in the in the online environment. Um, and. Even though students want more in person, there is a conversation we need to have with students about um, how they actually learn best. You know, active learning, learning by doing is often the best way of learning some computing concepts. Um, so the in person. Is going to be a blend of. The lecturer talking like this, but also a lot of problem based learning. Solve this problem. Lecturers with teaching assistants will walk around and answer your questions. Um, and I think something you, you've got to consider as students is, is being robust when you go in into a university uh, environment. Um, you may not know everything and you've got to be comfortable with not knowing everything. Um, I'm comfortable with asking questions that may you know you may think that makes it that this question will make you look silly in front of your colleagues it doesn't there's probably 20 other people in the class very happy that you're about to ask that question because they're too scared too as well so being brave and being robust i think is something that you've, you you need to develop as you go into a university because there will be topics um that you don't understand um or the amount that you are required to pick up in a week or two could be a lot and some of it will stick and some of it. Just make a note on it. It will come to you later. OK. 
Um, how will it be in the future? Well, I think that robustness is all about being a self learner. Um, if you are interested in computing um, and you see it as a career long term, computing changes incredibly fast. Um, those topics I put up earlier, you know, the cloud didn't really exist when I started in computing. You know, we called them mainframes in, in, the, in our day. Um, the web didn't exist when I started in BT. Um, it certainly didn't exist in the, in the form that you'd recognize today when I was doing my degree. There are languages developing all the time, mobile phones, everything is changing all the time. You will have to learn continuously. Um, and in industry, having the opportunity to go away on a training course and be taught by someone is a luxury. Um, there are you know, lots and lots of online resources now, and you will be expected to continuously learn if you stay in computing as a career. So getting used to that throughout university is probably something to uh, start building your skills in. Just as a struct as an example, this is actually my module structure. So I'm currently teaching year two. Each of the chevrons is a week. So there's 11 weeks in a semester. So in the first week, there was a timetabled online session and there was also a timetabled in person session where I would be delivering new ideas. Um, those online sessions go for the first seven weeks. From week four, the in person sessions become Q and A's. So the students have a, a day where they I deliver new content. They are given the exercises, which you can see in green at the bottom. Um, and they're expected to do the exercises and then come and see me in an in-person session where I go over the, um, the exercises with them and answer any questions. The green is there is the things that you would do in your own time. So they have a full set of uh, self-paced tutorials, so step-by-step -step things that walk them through what I need them to know uh, and be able to do. Um, and then they have exercises with which they can practice those skills. They also have small group sessions that they can book onto. So I have I teach a class of 60. There are five groups of 12 and the students can just book on and, and ask for extra help in those sessions. And at the end of the seven weeks, we then move into a project phase where we put the students into teams. We introduce them to a real client from industry and for four weeks they work together. Now I've put that in that sort of gradient between orange and blue because some of it will be online and some of it will be in person. Um, ideally, more of it will be in person, but obviously we're in a situation that is very fluid at the moment with uh, with COVID, so we don't know. But that's the sort of structure we have at the moment. What I would hope is that this line at the top, this blue line, can actually go orange very soon, and all of that would be done in person. Now, this might look like a bit of a weird slide, um, but something we've been talking about in the university is, is managing expectations and, and trying to get students to have a metaphor for how they will learn. So on the left hand side here, I've got a tour bus. And if you've ever been on one of these buses as they go around Cardiff, this one goes around Athens. Um, once you're on the bus, the way you learn is by listening to a guide, right? And you can't get off the bus. Everything is set. You're going on a set route um, and you're going to be told set things by, by the guide. Um, you can look around, obviously, and you can augment it with your own notes, but most of the learning is pretty set. That might be what things are like in year one or at the start of a semester or the start of a topic. But as you progress through the three years, by the end, you want it to be a bit more like the right, the right hand side, which I'm suggesting is a bit more like an expedition. And the lecturer is actually that person at the back. They're there to go along with you. They'll answer your questions and they'll just make sure you don't go anywhere dangerous. OK, so you want to be by the end this self-directed learner um, who is mentored and facilitated by a lecturer rather than someone who is just told what to do um, and controlled by that first uh, like, like the first picture. So the expectations will, will change over the year. Over the three years, it might start where you attend a lecture in university and you do exercise in your own time. That's what most people expect university to be like at the moment. But well, we're looking quite a lot, quite a lot at flipped learning. So you watch the lecture in your own time and you come 
to an in-person session and you do the exercises. That active learning, that learning by doing, that might be the best way of using the in-person time. So these are the things that you know, we're actively looking at now. These are the types of things I probably ask universities when you go to open days is, is it lecture based? How much exercises? How are you using the in-person time? Um, and on the right hand side, as you can see, you know, some of the things that you will need to do as students is, is really have this robustness so that you can push through problems, um, that you can find other sources of information. So if from the lecture you don't quite get something, the lecturer will typically signpost lots of other places that you can find things. Go and find them yourself. Bring other sources together. Get good at making notes. Can you make notes from memory after watching a lecture? Then go back and watch the lecture and see if you are correct with the notes you made. Record questions. It might be that you're asked to watch a, a 30 minute lecture or a 30 minute session and 10 minutes in there was something that you don't get. Stop the video, write down a question, carry on. There will always be the opportunity for Q&A with the module leaders. So essentially it's, it's becoming more of an emphasis on you as students driving that feedback loop getting the answers to the questions you want based on the materials that the module leaders will be providing. After graduation, well, obviously one option is that you go on to further study. Um, you can do a master's and that could be a continuing master's. Um, so we offer a master's in advanced computer science um, or in a speciality such as artificial intelligence. Um, it could be that you want to go and some, do something completely different. Um, so there are conversion masters as well. Um, for example, uh, we do um, a conversion masters in data journalism. So uh, you could use your computing skills and blend it with with English skills um, and journalism skills uh, and write reports using data. And you've probably seen that in the new in the papers over the last few years. People have used COVID data and then done articles about them. People have looked at Facebook, people have looked at the referendum um, and how data was used to drive politics. Um, data journalism would get into those sort of things. Obviously, you could go into employment and as I've said earlier, do ask about the support provided. Make sure you've got a good CV that you know how to take an interview. Um, modern uh, IT companies often don't do interviews. They might actually ask you to just go along and explain a situation at a whiteboard. So there are lots of different ways of assessing you, um, which is why getting work experience is good. There will be careers events. We do things like speed dating with employers. Um, and obviously personal branding, ha having a LinkedIn profile, maybe having a GitHub account, places where you can show um, what you're capable of um, online. Um, Cardiff has an alumni network, but I would suggest just build an alumni network yourself. Get to know the students when you're in year one, get to know the years two and three. Um, because they will leave, they will get jobs, and then maybe they'll be helping their companies recruit you in a couple of years time. So do build those networks when you start getting into university. Um, it is worth developing an awareness of the world of work, so I would definitely suggest trying to get at least a summer placement over the three years is good. Be aware of different working patterns. The world has changed because of the pandemic. There are companies now like GitLab where everybody works remotely. Everybody works like I am now at home um, and they only come together maybe once or twice a year. Um, and the way that those companies are successful is, is, a di is different to the way companies that co-locate are successful. They have to change their ways of working. Um, and I think the other thing that comes out of the pandemic is that you will actually be competing against a global market of talent. Um, if work can be done anytime, any place, anywhere in the world, then you have to prove your worth against an Indian developer, an Australian developer, or an American developer. Um, so having a multifaceted um, range of skills that you're not just a great programmer, but you have some specialities as well, that you're good in a team, that you're well organized, you're disciplined and be able to show all those things um, will position you well in that market. What do our students do afterwards? 
all of these types of things. Um, many of them go off to become software developers or engineers. Um, we certainly have many now who become data scientists, especially those who have a mathematical background. Um, I've looked after people on placements who are now cybersecurity consultants, um, project or product management. Um, so project managers, you will help run or facilitate the team. Product managers will actually look after what features should be going into a product. Um, others have just gone into what we call consultancy with technology companies. Um, so we've got people with people like Deloitte um, who just go out and consult about what technologies maybe companies should be considering. And as I said, data journalism would be another one through our conversion masters. And I've just take I took a screenshot yesterday off LinkedIn. Um, I am linked. I am linked with a number of our former students um, and current students. So, for example, Meg uh, in in the middle there, and uh, Tom at the bottom. They're currently third year students, um, but Kieran um, in the middle there. He left in 2018. Is now, as you can see, a senior software engineer. Um, Anson left last year. Daniel left last year. So did Amina. Um, and Scott is a student I looked after on a placement. So that's just from the top page of my LinkedIn profile. Um, you can see real data about where our students have moved on to. So summary um, and leaves time for questions. So computing is still a growth area. Um, the, the demand for computing skills is still huge. Um, so a degree in computing um, but also a passion for the subject uh, will put you in a good place um, to, to get employment. Um, you can make a real impact on the world with computing skills. Uh, modeling, for example, climate change, that requires computing power um, to really make sense of all the data that is out there. As I said, I've worked on the NHS. Um, if any of you have been into hospital, um, and, and actually observed how wards work, um, you'll see that there's a lot of inefficiencies in the NHS. If you can make it easier for doctors to be with patients rather than at a terminal, you're just improving the throughput and the health of, uh, of us all. Um, university courses, they'll give you core skills. All of them will do a certain set of things. They'll teach you how to program, they'll probably show you databases, um, There'll be some theory of computation in there. Um, but a lot of them then will diversify and they will follow their research subjects. Um, so go back to my previous recommendation. Don't just look at what's taught, look at what the university's research as well. Make sure you don't forget your soft skills as well. So being a really good programmer is one thing, being a disciplined professional developer who can talk to other peop people at their level of skill, can understand the problem, not just a solution, will work well with others, will share their knowledge, will admit their mistakes. That will also help you get on in a career in computing. My personal view, it hasn't really changed. I think in 2021 and onwards, 2022, we will not go back to how we were. Um, before the pandemic, there will be this blend of in-person and online. I think we're still finding what is the perfect blend, um, but online definitely has its place. Um, and therefore, we need to we need to do more on our side as as lecturers and academics to transform both the teaching and learning models. But I also think on the student side, um, that idea of developing your robustness and your your disciplines for um, Working through online materials on your own is something that that will be um, a key thing for you as you look as you move forward. So with that, I will stop and I'll say it's time for any questions. I'm happy for you to unmute and ask them or you can put them in the chat. Brilliant, thanks, Carl. That's great. So any questions now for Carl, put them in the chat and then um, We'll do our best to answer them. OK, so there we go. So I thought we had a question there, but it was Kevin answering um, 
previously that um so yeah you know, i think that, that was kevin who put the seb something else earlier on when i did the mentimeter yeah so network engineering um which there would certainly be some cybersec in there um but yeah it is a distinct area as well i've had people in the past um talking about what you know, wanted to work in cybersecurity and talking about ethical hacking and stuff like that um yes. And there are courses out there, aren't they? Would that come under a cybersecurity course? Yes. Yeah, so ethical hacking is essentially um, hacking to find the vulnerabilities in a system. Yeah. You know, so um, the only way to know how to fill a, vul a film of vulnerability is you actually have to know you've got the vulnerability. So an ethical hacker will actually tell you you've got the vulnerability. Yeah. Um, an unethical hacker will just hack <laughs> and not tell you yeah. that you've got a Absolutely. vulnerability. Um, and yes, you can get you can actually get certified, I believe, in in ethical hacking. Um, some of my former colleagues at BT went off and did the ethical hacking courses. And um, once you've done it, I think you actually have to take a pledge that you will use your skills for good, <laughs> because obviously you know you now you now know how to hack, um, yeah. and you get access to some tools that could do some very clever and very nasty things. Um, so you basically make a pledge that you will use these things for um, the purposes they were intended. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay. But uh, yeah, as I said, if you come to Cardiff now, um, if I just move forward a slide, um, we've got a brand new building now. Um, the School of Computer Science and Mathematics now share a brand new building right next to Cate's train station. So if you were to come to an open day, this is where you were, would come. And what I would suggest is there's a tour, make sure you go to the fifth floor where we have our cyber range. And as I said, what that does is it simulates a smart city. So there's a train line, there are factories, um, and you can actually see what might the impact be of a hacker disrupting our everyday lives. Wow. So it's a very useful thing to go and see. You know, he um, talks about the, um, we're just looking now, um, we just had a question now from Kevin. As the computing industry is constantly growing, do you think a university degree is enough nowadays to get a job placement, or will you need a lot more certifications such as um, CCNAs and other certifications? So that's a really good question, Kevin. Uh, a degree at the moment is enough in most situations. Most, most of our students go out and they will get a full-time job at the end of the degree based purely on having a degree uh, and one thing to say here is you don't have to have a first or a 2-1 right a 2-2 is a perfectly good degree and it will get you um, employment as well um, but if you're aiming at the higher end of the market um, at the end of your degree course having your cv laden with other things is is valuable so those who have done summer placements will look better. Those who maybe have been an, a STEM ambassador, they will look better. Um, now, what we've also started doing now is we've tried to find industry certifications that go alongside some of our modules. So on, on my program, um, in our second year, we have a module um, on a topic called DevOps, which essentially is the automation of um, testing and deployment. So when you make a change to your code on your laptop, um, what you want is a process that will deploy it into the cloud automatically without you having to go through a manual process. Um, what we've done is we've agreed with Microsoft that um, the students can do the Azure DevOps certification, or well, the fundamentals one certainly, for free. Right. So you can get um, some early certifications on the path to being a fully certified Azure engineer as well, um, alongside your degree. So yeah, great question, Kevin. Um, obviously, you can do things like micro certifications these days as well with people like FutureLearn. Um, you can do, a, if you keep your eye on the big players like Google and Amazon uh, and Microsoft and IBM, um, they often run offers on online certifications as well. So I know there was one on fundamentals of AI that ran not so long ago. Um, those types of things look really good on your CV. So, so you will differentiate yourself in the market. 
Um, but at the moment, my view is um, a degree would still be enough to get you into a junior developer position um, in the market as it stands at the moment. If you want to go for the higher companies, higher wages, the more you've got on your CV, the better. Does that answer your question, Kevin? Brilliant. Um, one thing I was going to ask was, and I might have missed this, um, there, there's not many of them about, right, degree apprenticeships. Um, I know that CGI are offering, um, a, I've, I've got a, a software engineering apprenticeship, I think at Swansea, yeah, and I just yes. wondered if you, uh, and I know USW do these um, apprenticeships, Network 75, they're not really, they're not, they, they're not exactly classed as degree apprenticeships because they're funded slightly differently. I just wondered yep. what it would if if you had any plans to to roll any of those out if you had any um, yep. sort of pipeline. So we run a degree apprenticeship version of the applied software engineering program. Cool. Um, now the the interesting thing here is an apprenticeship is essentially you you work alongside a master. It's the old master and apprenticeship model um, so you're in employment um, and you should be getting developed by the employer and then maybe getting some sort of release into academia so that when you come out you don't just have a job you, you know you've graduated from apprentice to whatever uh, to a job you've got a degree as well mm. um, now we run that um, primarily our main employer is admiral insurance who we work with yeah. Um, and those um, people at Admiral get some day release uh, to do their studies with us. Um, and then they go back into the workplace and they obviously have to work really hard in their evenings and weekends um, because they, they're still doing their day job. So they don't have the time to study. They have to fit that in and around their other three days of work. Um, I believe Swansea offer a different model where it is essentially a half a day release. Um, so I think it's something like a Wednesday afternoon into the evening. Mm. Um, I don't know which employers they work with. Um, and I think the thing about degree apprenticeships is um, it's a very different model in Wales. And actually, well, the way it seems to be working with ours is um, companies are sending existing employees onto the degree apprenticeship rather than it being something the school leavers can apply to, which seems to be more of the model in England. So we're not seeing at the moment anyone coming to us as a school leaver on a degree apprenticeship program. Mm. Um, I mean, currently, the situation currently is it's something and I've said this to the students that more and more students are interested in this because they see more and more opportunities in England and Wales are keen to catch up in terms of their apprenticeships. And I think it was only about 1% of students took on yeah. uh, a degree apprenticeship um, in Wales last year. So it's a really, really small percentage, but, it, but, I, but there is a lot of interest in the model. Um, and we have lots of students looking at degree apprenticeships. Yeah in sort of business, IT, computing, and seeing those available at some of those English universities. But then obviously then you would have to live in England and, and while you work for that company. Yes. Um, so I think the, the model in England is very different to the model in Wales. Um, and it, it seems to me at the moment, the, the, the Welsh ones are just are just not advertised. You know, yeah. they're just not made available to to, um, to our school leavers. It all seems to be employer driven rather than student driven. Um, so that's an interesting one for me, for really for me to take away that there is this interest. Um, mm. Now, what I can do about it, I'm not sure. I mean, that that's actually a Welsh government HEFQ issue. That's something for the Minister of Education, really not not for not for me. But we do have a scheme. Um, our applied software engineering program is a good scheme for that. Um, but what we're not seeing is people straight out of school going straight onto a degree apprenticeship with with a Welsh scheme. Um, I would certainly encourage um, 
the students on the call and, and the students who watch the recording um, to check out what the English model is. Yeah, we have students who um, the ones that are only ones that are coming out to light in Wales for IT and business or whatever it seems to be the ones that um, I think C CGI are, are doing in partnership with Swansea. So that's right. come out. But then obviously the University of South Wales offer the Network 75, but they are all by any other name a degree apprenticeship because they work three days with a, um, a company who pay for their degree and they get paid a salary and then two days a week they go to USW and do a uh, yeah. a course in terms of that but it's the, because of the nature of the way it's funded yeah it's not classed as a degree apprenticeship but it is a degree apprenticeship in anything else okay. but name in terms of that okay. but there are you know but there is a lot of interest so for example we would spend a lot of our assemblies talking about some of the opportunities just over the bridge in terms of companies and you know big companies offering you know and also quite good salaries as well you know pay, yes. pay, paying yes paying students 19,000 20,000 pound starting um and obviously giving them day release to go off and and go at a, a nearby university in England to do it so um I think that's a model that Wales may end up pursuing yeah and I think um you know either of our programs could convert to that. Um, I mean, the other thing we've been quite keen to look at are what we call level seven apprenticeships. Um, so that would be you do your master's while in a job. Yeah. So do your degree as normal, but then actually the apprenticeship would be alongside a, um, a master's, especially mm -hmm. on something like data science. That might be a, a good way of looking at things. Um, but yeah, I'll take that away um, because at the moment, you know, the, the number of degree apprentices we have is quite small. Um, yeah. And if it was to grow, um, being ready for that growth would be good. The other thing I was going to say was, you know, in terms of you did mention um, I, about the entry requirements for the courses and they need to do maths for a couple of them, don't they? You said. Yes. But, yeah, those are the ones that obviously where you've probably got limited spaces because it's, it's um, study abroad was one, wasn't it? Was it study abroad? That one, is that one there, the MSI and yeah. year abroad? OK, what about in terms of it? Some of our students do the BTEC um, level three diploma, yep. the subsidiary diploma, right? So they're doing those at the moment. Um, are those absolutely are, are you are those fine to transfer onto your courses with oh yeah so um the old style btec we used to ask for the star d star d star yeah with the new style btec i believe it is dmm okay well, we're only doing uh, single. see we're only doing that because a lot of the colleges will offer because they will just as students will just do computing they'll just do it yeah. in 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 six forms we mix and match so you have a student who will do say may even do a level computing and btec it or may do btec it single equivalent of one a level alongside business alongside math yeah. say in terms of that i think um I would, I would have to defer here to our admissions officer because um, she will know exactly what what we would make the offer in that blended approach. Um, now, her name's Louise Knight. Um, she will typically be at every open day. Um, I think there's an open day coming up November the 27th, if that's a Saturday. Um, and, and Louise will almost certainly be there. Um, but yeah, we would certainly accept the, the new BTEX and, and you would get an offer that was the equivalent of ABB, but with the BTEC instead. Yeah, well, we're doing the at the moment, we're in the last year of the old BTEC, so we right. so we, we do those. Um, so lots of our students are, are, are doing those at the moment in terms of it. Um, and you know, obviously getting really, really good offers with it, but it's probably the last, it might be the last year with the current year 12, because they're moving to the ones that have got exams in it. Yeah, um, I think what you'll find is that there are some universities that will will accept a BTEC. Um, some of the absolutely top, top universities probably require A-levels. Yeah, because we, what we do is because um, what we found from our students is that 
Um, most of our students are mixing and matching. Yeah, so, you know, our students what are taking BTECs alongside the A-levels. So it's actually for some of the courses, you know, some of our, you know, some of the courses will just say, right, if you're doing A-levels, we'll have three A's. If you're doing the three separate BTECs, we'll have three distinctions. But yeah. the fact that, uh, as I say to the students, because very often they can't find it on the, on the UCAS pages, the best way of doing it is to look at, say, your page, and you see that you're willing to take a triple BTEC where someone doesn't do any A-levels, yeah? And and actually, if our program is, is more academic than that, because some of our students are just doing one BTEC alongside two exam-based A-levels. So I often say to students, if you see um, a university that is willing to take a triple BTEC, yeah, you, you obviously they are they are quite friendly towards BTEC, so they're quite happy, they like the courses, because they're willing to take just BTECs. Yeah, um, certainly both of our programmes are happy to take either. I'd say the computer science is more favourable to A-level students. The applied software engineering, traditionally, that's where a lot of BTEC students have gone, purely because BTECs are slightly more applied and therefore they fall more naturally into the applied nature of the applied software engineering. In our first year, I think all of our students were BTEC students. Um, I think now we're probably 60, 40 A level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, and also um, some of our students have an advantage because they have done computing A level. I mean, one of the things, one of the situations that we sometimes find is that because computing A level is a very small cohort in Wales, you know, you might only have 100, 150 students in Wales, you know, um, doing yeah. A-level computing in the whole of Wales. And they tend to, and obviously they're the most able students, um, you know, very often, lot, you know, students with multiple A-stars or whatever, and it can be one of the hardest A-levels to do. Um, and I think sometimes our students worry that that they might get a B or a C in computing, but that, you know, that's, that's a reflection not on their ability, but the fact that um, it's one of the most able cohorts doing an A-level that they're up against. They're up against, you know, students who might have on average six A-stars at GCSE or yes. seven A-stars, which is not the same for nearly every other A-level out there. Yeah, and it's it hasn't really changed since I applied to university. Um, a computer science A-level is, is not a prerequisite for a computer science degree. No. Um, as I said, the one that sometimes is required is mathematics yeah uh, and that's for the more theoretical parts of the um the computer science curriculums um and, you know i i always wished my computer science a level had been the one that was required because that's the one i got an a in. <laughs> um yeah. but it's it's not the case it's never been the case um <laughs> computer science has always been just another a level yeah when um i don't know of any universities who say you must get a certain grade in your computer science A level to do a computer science degree. No, it, it wouldn't be. They just wouldn't be able to do it because there's so few students yeah. doing the um, A level because they don't have access to it. We were lucky to have the opportunity. Our students that they have, we can offer the subject um, because some 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 schools aren't able to offer it. Yeah. Um, are there any more questions from the students? Yes, that's what we need because we've been talking here. So any more questions, everyone, um, please put them in the chat. And it could be anything. It could be um, anything about the different sorts of courses, the differences between the courses, entry requirements, um, facilities, you know, anything that you're interested in about this, please put them in the chat. OK. I, I'm conscious of time, um, so if nothing's coming in the chat, I'll probably say to the students just to email me and then I'll pass on any questions. The only other thing I was going to mention was the Welsh back. Um, I'm happy to take the Welsh back as, um, for, for, as a replacement for one of the A-levels. The last time I wrote a slide for admissions, yes. The only A-level we don't accept is general studies. Yeah. But the Welsh back, unless something has changed and I don't know, yes, we still accept the Welsh back. 
it would all be on the um, on the website. If I quickly yeah. stop sharing there and just uh, go to So now, this is, is problem 13. Sorry, I was gonna while you were doing that, I was gonna fail for a bit. Last year, 90% of all our courses, all our where people applied to the Welsh pack back as a as a as a sort of replacement for an A level. So um 90% yeah. do. But I just wanted to um check that it was the same for all your courses. Yeah, so let's let's see what we're saying currently. So if you go to our browser and you look at cardiff.ac.uk slash computer science, yeah. nice, nice picture of our brand new building. Um, oh, I wonder who that is there. Um, so you can check out our courses. Obviously, you want to go to undergraduate. Remember I said check out our research as well. Um, so let's have a look at undergraduate courses. Um, here are all the options you can see we list we listed as the two families and then the variations for your in industry and year of study abroad so let's have a look at computer science because that's the one most people apply to um, you can see here are our options you can have computer science with a year in industry or with a year of study abroad and then you can have the masters the integrated masters or you can have um, with security and forensics. So let's just go to the vanilla basic computer science. If you go to this page, what you can see are the entry requirements. Yeah, typical so Welsh typical, back there. Yeah. yeah, typical A level ABB, BBB, typical Welsh back. Welsh back advanced skill challenge will be accepted in lieu of one A level. Fantastic. So that means um, everybody that obviously, you know, um, you know you can use that is is equally as important as your a levels that you're doing you know so you know um if you needed to get three a grades you you know the welsh back could be one of those and it's interesting you've got the btech there the fact that cause they obviously you don't, can't list every btech that we do but the fact that you you're willing to take a triple btech where someone doesn't do um you know the a level the the a levels there um shows that Cardiff is a B, is B tech friendly in terms of um, yeah. the, the courses that they offer. Yeah, so it's DDM. I, I was one out on that one. Um, if you quickly look at the MSI, um, so the MSI will have entry requirements. A, it's it's slightly higher. It's AAB to ABB and must include maths. Yeah. Um, and then the B tech offer, you can see. Okay. Yeah, and as I said, ours will be doing single BTEC. So the fact yeah. that when they see that you're willing to take students who are doing the triple BTEC instead of doing three A levels, that does give them confidence that 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 um, their single BTEC will be fine because they've got a more academic program. They've got many of them have got combining it with A levels as well. Yeah. And, and just then, you know, just to, as I said earlier. Look at our look at the research interests. Most universities will say it. So we've got research areas in artificial intelligence, um, cybersecurity, and also visual computing. So that's been something in the in our university for a long time. So I don't know if any of you are aware of how um, films like Planet of the Apes or Avatar were made, where the actors typically wear um, full suits with little white dots on them that are reflective, and then um, those are turned into um, the images or the avatars that you see on the screen. Um, I actually had that done to me. I actually wore little magnets, little uh, reflectors all over me. Nothing as, as glamorous as a film. It was actually to uh, analyse back pain. Um, so it was there to you know uh, analyse my movements, my bending, my flexing, my rotation. But it's the same technology. Brilliant. Yeah. That's 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 the you know, the impact of our research in the real world. So um, do have a look at what other what what you, the universities you're thinking of applying to. Do have a look at their research records um, because the likelihood is there will be modules then, and you can always find out the modules um, by looking at the courses. Um, and if you pick one of the courses. You should be able to find something similar to 
this page here where it says the course structure. And you'll be able to see what the modules are. So as I said, in the first year, you do all the same modules. These are all core. In year two, there are a number of core modules that you must do, but then there are optional modules that you must pick. As a guide, it's 120 credits per year. And if you go to year three, there are only two core modules, one on emerging tech and a project that you must do, and then the rest of it you fill in from all of these. So for example, there's a module there on computer vision. Ah, that was our research interests. The likelihood is computer vision will be taught by someone who is actively researching visual computing. OK. Yeah. And it's a fantastic opportunity to get, you know, you get the opportunity to be taught by someone who's really sort of prominent in that area of research. That's a brilliant um, opportunity. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carl. That was fantastic. And um, I'll say to the students, if um, if anyone has any um, sort of questions or whatever, um, come back to me and then I'll pass them on to um, Carl. Thank you very so much. Um, are you OK if I send a copy of the team's um, recording that we we've made to the students um yeah. in the computer classes no problem at all john brilliant thank you ever so much carl have a lovely evening thank you everyone for coming we really appreciate you giving up your time um thanks carl as always a brilliant presentation thank you ever so much no problem at all see you now bye bye good luck everyone bye, bye everyone